Great. All right, everybody, it is 7.30. So I shall say good evening and welcome to the Town Board of the Town of Austin Town Hall meeting for Tuesday, April 20th, 2021. Please rise and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And justice for all will be the beginning topic of my comments this evening. Um, while I would like to start to talk about the theme of our town hall tonight, instead, before I dive into that, I want to acknowledge the work of the jury on the Derek Chauvin case today, and also that of the Minnesota AG, Keith Ellison, and the prosecutorial team. We heard that Chauvin was found guilty on all three charges earlier this evening. We know this is welcome news for many of us in our community and our country, as we have watched for far too long as others got away with this type of behavior with impunity. So many were not held accountable for their actions. This is a moment of accountability for a public servant who did not serve the public. And we know that the work towards making our criminal justice system more equitable does not end with this verdict. We want our public to know that the town board is committed to doing everything in our power to making our community more equitable for all. We believe Black Lives Matter. Our thoughts are with the family of George Floyd tonight. We know that no verdict can bring him back. We also know that this verdict will elicit some very strong feelings from our community. And as one of our many municipal boards, we want you to know we will be here to make space for the reactions, the conversations, and the learning that we will all do around this tragic set of circumstances and the verdict that was delivered today. It is heavy. It is hard to go into the happy conversations that we want to now have, but we are moving in to our town hall topic this evening, um, which is the overarching discussion of our Earth Week in the town of Ossining. And some of my announcements are geared towards that. Green Ossining has put together a fantastic calendar of activities around town, both virtual and in person. On Saturday, Councilwoman Feldman and I joined the Austin Parks Habitat Stewards at Ryder Park to help support the growth of native plants where we cleared invasives and planted new plants, which can hopefully outcompete the other types. We got a lesson from Donna Sherritt about each of the new species and how pollinator friendly they were too. Big shout out to Patrick Vipperman, Chief Steward, all the volunteers and our parks department for their great work on Saturday, taking care of some of the more passive areas of our parks. I also stopped by the Green Austin tent at the farmer's market where residents can drop off their food scraps at our food scrap recycling program. The Green Austin booth also has lots of helpful information. They're gonna be out again this Saturday about how to save the planet and save money at the same time. They were promoting our Grid Rewards program, which is an app you can download to save you money. And you're gonna hear more about that tonight, as well as Energy Smart Homes and Community Solar. And as mentioned, you're gonna hear about all of these tonight a little bit later as part of our Earth Week Center Town Hall. I know that there were also Stash the Trash events I was supposed to go to. And thank you again, Councilwoman Feldman. I think you led one of those, um, which was great. And unfortunately, um, I had my second shot of uh, my COVID vaccine on Saturday and it had its uh, presumed after effects on Sunday and I, I was kind of uh, on the couch all day, let's just say. Yesterday I participated in a lunch and learn where we heard from our friends with the Cornell University Climate Adaptive Design Studio program. The studio was originally hosted in Austin during the 2019 fall semester and the student developed designs reimagined our waterfront to be more resilient to climate change and sea level rise. You can see the students' final projects at the Austin train station from 5 a.m. to 10 a.m. every day this week during the week. 
Um, also, you can see the video on YouTube um, that's on our town website. And uh, I think it may also have been on Facebook. It was streamed live on Facebook. So that'll also be available on Facebook. On Thursday, we will participate in another Lunch and Learn with Sustainable Westchester showcasing some easy ways residents can save green by going green. Many of you have already taken part in our evening webinars about energy smart homes. Thursday Zoom will also cover two other programs, Community Solar, which can reduce your electric bill by 10%, and the Grid Rewards app, which can help you earn money, yes, earn money, by lowering your energy usage during peak hours. Visit the Town of Austin Facebook page for the Zoom information or go to Green Austin's website, www.greenaustin.org and look for the April 22nd events. Also, the more people who sign up, the more we, your local municipalities, can earn. Yes, earn, because there are $5,000 incentives for promoting each of these programs and getting sign-ons. So come on, people. Help our earth and your pocketbooks. You can learn more about all these wonderful Earth Week events on the Green Austin website and later on during our meeting. One last Earth Week shout out um, to the instrument drive at Mike Risco Music. You can drop off gently used instruments to be refurbished and donated to organizations and children in need. You can contact the music school or store to schedule an appointment to drop off those instruments. Donation programs are not always considered when people think about going green, but donating items saves them from piling up in a landfill. And on May 1st, Green Austin is going to be hosting a townwide tag sale to help residents declutter their lives. Tag sales are a great way to find much needed kids clothing and household items without spending money at big box stores. Okay, now for some non-Earth Day related information. The Austin Briarcliff Vaccine Angels reported this week that they have assisted about 250 people in getting the vaccine. The Angels have collaborated with local businesses to make sure vaccines don't go to waste. They are also still collecting names of homebound individuals for the mobile vaccine units, which were put on hold while the J&J &J vaccine is put on hold, uh, but they may be rolling out um, the two shots um, soon for the homebound program. We're waiting to hear from that. And if not, we may have other solutions for our homebound. So please, if you do know somebody who needs a vaccine who is homebound, please do reach out to our O-Town Vaccine Angels at gmail.com. You can also call my office at 762-6001 or call the Angels at 914-236-4567. It is so inspiring to see all the great work these volunteers have done and people are still signing up to help every single day. So thank you to all of our angels. You are incredible. And you're helping to get Austin vaccinated. The 2021 Town and County tax bills are due on April 30th. The easiest way to pay is online via Express Pay, available through the town's website. You can also pay via email or by placing your stamped envelope in the dedicated drop box at the Austin Post Office Lobby, which gets delivered straight to our offices and doesn't get processed through White Plains before delivery. Or you can still stop by in person at Town Hall, 16 Croton Avenue, where the tax office is set up to take payments in the lobby between 9 a.m. and 2.30 p.m. Monday through Friday. If you have questions about your town county taxes, just give the tax office a call at 914-762-8790 or email hperlowitz at townofostening.com. Our wonderful tax receiver, Holly Perlowitz, will be happy to answer questions as will her staff. Before I wrap up my announcements, I would like to share this proclamation in honor of Monarch butterflies. This proclamation is part of the town's ongoing commitment to helping native species and pollinators flourish in our community. A few weeks ago, we signed the National Wildlife Federation Monarch Pledge to raise awareness about the monarch butterfly. Through our partnership with the Village of Austin, we learned this week that plant diversity peaks at three weeks between mowings of your lawn and peak bee diversity occurs when lawns are only mowed every two weeks, which represents a grass height of about four inches or so. We have a cute graphic to share that you can print out at home that lets your neighbors know why your lawn is being grown to, to maybe a little higher than they might feel comfortable with to protect bees and other pollinators. Four inch lawns are also the tallest height under which grass should be kept to avoid ticks. The town has a proud history of creating pollinator friendly areas and protecting native species from invasives. As I mentioned previously, the past weekend, the Austin Parks 
habitat stewards and the parks department added more pollinator friendly plants, many of which the town purchased, some of which were donated from our stewards at Ryder Park. Also outside the Boat and Canoe Club is a monarch way station planter, planted for monarchs to visit as they migrate south, which I know Councilwoman Feldman was instrumental in helping with. We are also awarded a buffer and a bag grant for Sally Swope City Park this year, which will be planted as part of our ongoing restoration, adding more native flowering plant species to our parks, in addition to the buffers that we planted at Ryder in 2019, which are also pollinator friendly. Our recent bee legislation specifically requires beekeepers to have a food source nearby that consists of pollinator friendly species as well. And we thank all of those who participated in that legislation and making sure that it was friendly to all. Uh, so with that, Karina Scorsia, who's been very helpful with our Monarch Butterfly um, proclamation, as well as uh, a lot of the other um, initiatives that I mentioned, if you could just bring up the proclamation and we could take a look at it and share it with the public. And I can see half of it. So I'm just going to read it. Uh, Proclamation in honor of monarch butterflies. Whereas the town of Austin is home to many native plants and pollinator species, including the majestic monarch butterfly, which has sadly experienced massive population losses over the past few decades. And whereas the town of Austin recognizes that human health ultimately depends on well-functioning ecosystems and that biodiverse regions can better support food production healthy soil and air quality, and can foster healthy connections between humans and wildlife. And whereas pollinator species are in decline due to habitat loss and the use of pesticides, causing species like the monarch butterfly to decline significantly in the past 25 years. And whereas butterflies are extremely beneficial, pollinating many cultivated flowers and crops and serve as an indicator species for the ecological health of large geographic areas. And whereas in December, 2020, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service announced that the listing of the monarch butterfly as endangered or threatened under the Endangered Species Act is warranted and the beloved brown and orange monarch butterfly is now a candidate for protective measures under the Endangered Species Act. And whereas the town of Austin continues to explore environmentally friendly infrastructure legislation and practices with guidance from experts to best support local ecosystems and provide such benefits for our residents. And whereas the town of Austin renews its commitment to support local, state, and national efforts that protect, restore, and conserve habitats for pollinators as demonstrated in our recent beekeeping legislation and our planting of food sources for pollinators, such as the monarch butterfly, as well as foster a greater connection between residents and wildlife. And now, therefore be it resolved that I, Dana Leppenberg, supervisor of the town of Austin, with the enthusiastic support of the Austin Town Board, recognize the wonderful work done by residents during Earth Week to protect monarch butterflies and other native plants and pollinator species and encourage all residents to participate in community activities that support and celebrate pollinator protection. And I think that that's pretty much all I have for my announcement. So I just add, ask if any of my board colleagues would like to add anything to that or if they have any other additional announcements to share. And I'm gonna say- Hi. All right. Yeah, the um, Austin Ambulance Corps asked me to remind everybody that they have testing available for those who would like um, to be tested. So what specific types? They have the antigen testing and molecular testing available um, through their Facebook page, or you can contact them. Um, through their website and sign up for a test. So awesome. There you go. Great. Thank you. Anybody else? Any comments on anything? Statement, announcements, anything that you want to add? Okay. So with that, before we get into the agenda, I would like to remind everyone that tonight's meeting is a town hall meeting. So the format deviates slightly from our usual work session format. After each topic, we will open it up to the public for comments or questions. And once we get through our set agenda for this evening, we're happy to hear from members of the public on any topic at all. 
So for those of you joining us tonight, please take a moment now to locate your raise hand button on your Zoom screen so you can be recognized later when you would like to make a comment or ask a question. All right, with that, I'm going to start with the first item on our agenda. We have a special guest tonight, a local Eagle Scout, Jason Ewells, who is interested in proposing a project at Sally Swope Park. And the good news, it has to do with plantings. I know the board is looking forward to hearing your proposal, Jason. You're on. Hello, I uh, just wanna thank you again for having me on. I'm about to present to you my slideshow for my proposal for this project. I just wanna give a brief overview before we start. Basically, I've been to the Sally Swope um, uh, park before and there's like nobody there like every time I go there like it's, it's just very empty and I feel like personally um, if we were to put flowers there it would kind of brighten up the place so let's get into it just got to share my screen you guys can see this okay Okay, so basically I plan on creating and planting a flower bed in Sally, Slope, uh, Sally Swope Park. I plan to do so because hopefully this will attract people to the park. For those who are unfamiliar with an Eagle Project, um, it is the final step in a Boy Scouts journey. The goal of an Eagle Project is to help the community, whether that being the elderly or just a park, which is what I'm doing. The most common project being at T-Town. The next step I need for the approval process is a signature from the beneficiary, which I'm pretty sure is Ms. Levenberg. Then a signature from my unit leader, Mr. Race, the troops committee chair, Trish Morgan, and the local council approval, which is Mr. Whiting. Uh, I feel that these flowers will attract more people to this park and this will allow for the community to have a place of unity and peace. I also feel like these flowers will bring a sense of tranquility to the park. So this is the space that Mario Velardo cleared for me. Hopefully what I plan on doing is having the flowers on this curve so that it kind of like guides in the people to say, oh, look, there are pretty flowers. This looks like an awesome park. Jason, can you just use your cursor back to back up on that slide and just use your cursor to show exactly which spot you're talking about? Just So basically here on the flat part is where I plan on planting the flowers. And there are going thanks. to be five flowers that I will be showing you. Okay, thanks. So, uh, the requirements for each flowers that I had to look for, they had to be deer resistant, they had to be native, perennials, they needed to have high to medium level moisture, and they had to be non-intrusive. So this is the first choice of flower that I have, which is the purple creeping beauty phlox, and in parentheses will be the scientific name for it. So the height for this uh, purple creeping beauty is four to six inches. Its color is purple and it blooms in mid to late spring. And I like to add a special trait to make things a little interesting. So this one actually attracts na uh, native pollinators. The second one is the butterfly milkweed, which is um, one to three feet. Um, the color varies, but I am thinking of doing orange because I think that is the most attractive color for this flower. It blooms in late spring and summer, and it generates a watery, translucent sap. Third one is the mountain mint, also one to three feet, green. It blooms from July to September, and it is edible. The fourth slide is the tick seed, also known as Coryopsis. Um, it is one and a half feet to four feet tall. It's yellow, it blooms in the summer, and it tends to have long flower petals. And the last slide is the whitewood asters. These are two to four feet, they are white, they bloom in August and September, and their special trait is, well, first of all, they have 
heart-shaped leaves. Um, it's a little hard to see because I got a blurry image here. And also, this is edible when cooked. I looked it up on like two websites. I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't like pick these flowers and cook them myself, but um, that is just what I saw online. So I organized this by two different sections. Staggered bloom is when they bloom, according to from now till summer. And staggered height is the order I'm going to plant them in, which is from smallest to tallest. So the purple creeping beauty bring, uh, blooms mid to late spring. The whitewood asters um, bloom in August and September. The butterfly milkweeds bloom late spring to summer. The mountain mint uh, blooms from July to September and the tick seed blooms just in the summer. And for height, um, I already went over this, but um, if you are interested, I will leave my email in the chat if you want to know more about this. It's down again. It's down again? Not you. Sorry. Oh. My uh, internet's down. Well, thank you for listening. That is the end of my presentation. Thank you so much, Jason. That was a great presentation. And I am going to open it up to the board first for questions and comments. Okay. Uh, Jason, I just had a quick question. How large is the actual area where you're planting from the picture? I really couldn't tell. Like how many feet by how many feet is the area? I'm not sure. I went there to take a picture, but I didn't have a ruler. Um, I'm going to write an email to Mario. Let me just write down this question so I can relay it to him. And while Jason's writing down that question, um, I'm going to ask Jason, I think you might have gotten some input a little bit on your flower selection from a few people who might be considered experts. Um, did you want to talk about that at all? Um, it was kind of just, I reached out to different people. I reached out to one of our local Boy Scouts moms, who's in my troop. Um, gave me some advice. I reached out to actually one of my neighbors who I don't exactly know his occupation, but he helped me a lot too. And they gave, David Margulies. That is David Margulies. Yes. Right. Who you recommended. And, um, I think they basically, they all just gave me a list of perennials and showed like different pros and cons of each flower. And I felt like these five were the best. Okay. And, uh, I just want to mention that Jason met um, I sat at the park one day and it happened to be a time when Karina was meeting out with Don, out there with Donna Carrick. So we were going to apply for a buffer in the bag for Sally Swope. And um, so Donna was there, Mario was there, Jason and his dad were there and uh, Karina. And so Donna also gave a little bit of guidance just for everybody's uh, own edification about maybe some of the things that you wanted to consider um, when you were considering which types of plants to plant. And then, um, you know, we, we had some additional conversations, which then Jason went back and did his research and now he's coming back with this proposal. So uh, I'm not a good person to say, yes, these plants are great or no. So I'd love to have a copy of your presentation so that we could just get a little bit more uh, input. And I think it probably would be good also to know how many of each plant you're planning to plant and also what the timing is. Um, I think we talked a little bit about that in terms of when you need to do it and how long you think it might take. So uh, now I'm going to continue to ask my other colleagues if you guys have any other questions or comments. Yeah, I, I just, I'd like to ask, are you, uh, is he gonna have help doing this? I hope yes, so. I'm going to ask my Boy Scout troop for help. So it's not just going to be me and my family, it's going to be other scouts and that will count for uh, community service hours. Oh, okay. Excellent. Well, I, I love flowers, so it sounds great to me. Yeah, who doesn't love flowers? <laughs> People who are allergic. <laughs> Sometimes they don't. <laughs> Okay, Councilwoman Feldman, do you have any comments or questions? I think you directed Jason to us to begin with. So if you wanted to comment. 
I do. I am always happy or thrilled when uh, our up and coming Eagle Scouts choose one of our parks to uh, do their projects in and enhance our community. Um, you know, they're, they're such great, you know, budding community leaders and, you know, to have their work in our park and show that they've been thinking about our community and what would best enhance it always makes me feel really happy. Um, you know, the Sally Swope Park is dear to my heart, so I'm very happy he chose to work in that park, and I think it's going to be a great project. You know, yep. and enhancing our native pollinators is always a great thing. And so, Jason, thank any, you so much. You don't have any opinions about any of the particular flowers? Hmm? You don't have any opinions about these flowers at all? Um, I mean, it's a nice mix. I like purple and blue. Those are all good. The milkweed is, of course, going to support the, uh, the monarch butterfly. And that's great. You know, the more support the monarch can get, the, the better. And uh, I'm sure there are other native species that will be there as well. But uh, I like his color palette and his ideas. And I think it's great. All right. Thank you. I Anybody just have, have, yes. I have one more thing to say because... You, so who, well, I think you asked him how many uh, flowers. Or he, he, that is very hard to 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 to, to say how many. Because you you know it could be if you put them six inches apart or eight inches apart, you got to measure each time and you got to go. <laughs> well, planning, yeah, landscape planning, absolutely. What I plan on doing is I'm going to right after I get all your questions, I'm going to write an email to Mario and I'm just going to say, you know, what's the square footage for the area you gave me. I'm thinking of, so those, there were more flowers, but I think that those five flowers were the best options. So basically it's going to be a row of five and then however much space I have is going to be like, I don't know, like maybe six, six um, columns, just something along the lines of that. But yes, thank you. Okay, gotcha. Anybody else want to come board with questions? No, no question. Just comment. I think it's a great idea and a really great presentation. So thank you. Thanks, Greg. And uh, with that, I'm going to ask if there's anybody from our public who would like to comment on this presentation from Jason. And I see that there is a hand raised from Mr. Platt. Oh, hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, okay, I didn't know if I would uh, type into the chat. I, I'd like to thank Mr. Ewells for the presentation. Uh, and uh, I particularly enjoyed uh, Town Supervisor Levenberg's displaying the proclamation in honor of monarch butterflies and a special shout out to the bees. Uh, just as a suggestion, perhaps it's been discussed, so I'm sorry if I'm repeating. Uh, I changed out some of the grass, which is a monoculture around my current home, in favor of pollinating plants like butterfly bushes, Russian sage, and blue hyssop. So the latter two create a metropolis for a variety of our bee friends. So just a suggestion out there. And I, could, I can post this if I'm able to type in. You're actually, we don't have the chat function enabled, but um, please do send me an email. And it's funny, one of the things that we were kind of ruminating about, and I know that there's going to be um, some pollinator um, work done at the farmer's market this week. Um, and I think what there, and maybe Susie, you might be talking about that a little bit, right? So there is a project that's going on. And I think that they're going to be looking for people like you, Mr. Blatt, to please share uh, your property and that it is pollinator friendly and to, and to share best practices so that we can encourage our neighbors to do the same. So uh, I thank you for taking that um, on your yourself. And um, I don't know how I'm going to break it to my husband personally that, you know, we have to actually mow the lawn every, every two weeks instead of every five or six weeks, um, which is better for the bees. But you know, I, I will, um, <laughs> but definitely not using pesticides and finding different types of grasses and not hating clover or dandelions is all also good, good stuff, I think, right? So thank you very much for those comments. And I'm gonna now ask if there are anybody, if there are any other attendees um, who wanted to add to or comment on Jason's presentation. Oh, okay. Well, Susie Ross, you can raise your hand and comment. Please do. Just wanted to say that it's really exciting and I like
flowers also. And I definitely think that that park is going to look so much more beautiful instead of driving by and wondering what's going on. I know they're doing a lot of work there, but I think your project's really a great idea. And I love it and I can't wait to see it. So thanks for thinking about the town that way and wanting to invest your time this way. Thank you, Susie. Plus it will go on the pollinator pathway now. Exactly. Talk about that, yeah. That's right. So yeah. again, Jason, thank you so much. Um, I know that you have a couple questions to answer, but we're very excited that you picked um, uh, an often overlooked park uh, to for your attention for your Eagle Scout project. And I know that having those other volunteers from your troop helping you will also bring attention to the to the park from other their families as well. And as we do all this work to rehab the park, and we're hoping actually to make it ADA accessible as well, um, and to encourage. Um, the invasives to not continue to spread and to encourage more natives. We're, we're going to be planting more natives um, as well to fill in um, all the areas that were cleared. Um, having those really beautiful flowers right at the opening will be very, very welcoming. So we look forward to working together to um, figure out a path of planting forward. So thanks so much, Jason. And we'll, we'll talk again. We'll follow up with emails and stuff like that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great, great presentation. Okay, so on to the next topic. Um, we have a presentation this evening on energy smart homes, community solar, and grid rewards from Lauren Royce and Claire Kokoska, who are both with Sustainable Westchester. And we are, this is continuing our Earth Week themed agenda. They'll be presenting about three, these three programs, which were recently launched in partnership with Sustainable Westchester and our villages of Austin and Briarcliff, and also with tremendous guidance and support from Susie Ross and Green Austin, as well as the Sustainability Committee in Briarcliff. These programs stand to benefit the residents of Austin directly while helping our communities and our state achieve our sustainability goals. So thank you, Lauren and Claire, for your help shepherding these important programs along and also Susie. But I'm gonna open it up to Lauren and Claire now for to speak. Thank you so much, Supervisor and everyone. It's so nice to be here tonight. Uh, I'm Claire Kokoska. I manage the community solar program here at Sustainable Westchester. Um, and as, as um, she said, we're going to talk about three of our programs. Um, but first, I am just going to share my screen to get our presentation started. And for those of you who might not be familiar with Sustainable Westchester, um, we are a nonprofit organization based in Mount Kisco. And we are made up of 44, 44 member municipalities plus um, the Westchester County itself as, as a member. And we work directly with all of these municipalities and with the county to develop and offer uh, turnkey sustainability and renewable energy programs to um, the community and not just residents, but also the municipalities themselves, small businesses, houses of worship. Um, we're going to talk about three of these tonight, but just to briefly touch on the ones that we do offer. Um, Westchester Power, a lot of you might be familiar with our green energy supply program. Uh, and that is complementary with community solar, which is a solar energy uh, program that we're going to talk about a little bit tonight. Um, for electrification solutions, Energy Smart Homes is a program that we're very happy to offer. Lauren is going to talk more about that and how to electrify your homes with clean uh, heating and cooling and energy efficiency technologies. Um, we have our clean transportation uh, project where we try and encourage folks to make their vehicles electric vehicles and doing everything we can to ease the way for that. Um, we all know that our gas guzzlers have to go in time and we're doing what we can to make that easier. 
Uh, we have our grid efficiency programs, which includes grid rewards, um, which helps you earn cash back if you sign up and participate in that program. We'll talk more about that as well. And our virtual power plant program helps, uh, it's in the pilot stage now, but it essentially helps some people turn their homes into mini power generators, and especially those with solar panels on their homes. And that's one that's really exciting. It's all about battery storage, and we can't wait to um, develop that more. And we have to always think about zero waste, and our zero waste program uh, does what it can to help people learn about how to minimize our waste, what we're throwing in landfills, buy what we need and use what we buy. Um, and we always say that it's important to know that we encourage people not to feel like they have to do zero waste perfectly all the time, but even if we're trying, that is something and that's moving us all in the right direction. So to get us started tonight, I am going to talk about our community solar program. And um, the first two programs that I'm gonna talk about, um, we have been working with uh, Austining and Briarcliff and the green teams and um, Dana Levenberg and Susie Ross have been such wonderful supporters of these programs and, um, and pushing them to the community and letting everyone know um, about these two programs that are free to sign up for and provide energy savings through renewable energy and energy efficiency. So community solar uh, is a little bit different from the way that we all understand traditional rooftop solar to be. In traditional rooftop solar, you have a house with just the right roof conditions and you install solar panels on it and then your energy costs are lowered. But what we found in the first couple of years that we had our solar program was that 85% of the people that reached out to us interested in installing solar couldn't even install solar on their homes for financial reasons or because there was a beautiful tree in the way um, that they, they didn't want to cut down or their roof just wasn't facing the right direction. And then it completely excludes renters as well. So we knew that uh, we had to evolve our solar program to include a much wider swath of people. And um, that's how we ended up launching our community solar program in 2018. With community solar, you don't need to have any panels on your roof or wires to your home. And that doesn't just include a home as in a house, but also an apartment if you live in an apartment or a condo or rent. Um, we have a community solar farm, well, actually a number of community solar farms that someone is able to join. And notably, there is one community solar farm in particular that we are so excited to share with you all that is being built right in Austining at the Marinol campus, right by Ryder Road. It is, um, it's exciting because it's right, right in Austining, but also the Marinol sisters of St. Dominic are such I mean, they do such good community work. And um, so marrying the Marinol campus and Austining and renewable energy is just, is just a really beautiful partnership. So anyway, I just wanted to talk about that for a second, but with community Claire, solar. Claire, yeah. do you think it's on the, it's on the campus of the, of the brothers and fathers where the, where the, even though the sisters are right across the street. Oh, um, okay. Right. Thank you. So sorry about <laughs> I that. I actually exactly. did sign up for that. Great. Oh, that's great. That's great. Um, so anyway, with community solar, you would join the program and sign up to a specific community solar farm. And your specific community solar farm that you join um, has lots of your friends and neighbors that are a part of that same community solar farm. And as it generates solar power, it goes directly into the local electric grid that powers the entire community. And anyone who signed up to a solar farm through the program gets discounts on their monthly electric bills. And I'll talk a little bit more about how that works in just a minute, but I did just want to um, touch on the benefits of the program. New York State um, created, uh, built community solar as a model um, so that anyone 
anyone who signs up for community solar is guaranteed to save on their electric bills. Um, and through our program, we made sure that you save double what the state um, suggests. So anyone who's a part of the Sustainable Westchester Community Solar Program saves up to 10% off of their monthly electric bills each and every month. There is no installation of solar panels and no wires on your property or on your home. Uh, it's free to join and you can cancel any time at no cost. It's compatible with any energy supplier. Um, a lot of people that join Community Solar might have a third party energy supplier that's um, renewable energy based. And uh, so Community Solar is just a really good way to double your energy, your positive energy impact in that way as well. And you're supporting local renewable energy. So Community Solar all in all is an excellent program that really has no downsides at all. And to talk quickly about how the solar savings actually works, every single month, if you're a part of a community solar farm, you will earn a solar credit. And uh, that solar credit is subtracted from your monthly Con Ed bill. So let's say you have a Con Ed bill and it's $115 and you've earned a solar credit that's, let's say $100. Um, so step two is you pay Con Ed the new lower total after the solar credit gets knocked off of your Con Ed bill. So in this example, you pay Con Ed $15 only. And then the final step in this is that you will auto pay your solar farm for the solar credit you've earned at a 10% discount. So if you've earned a $100 solar credit, then you pay for that at a 10% discount and save $10 for the month. So every single month, whatever solar credit you earn, you save 10% off of that amount. And we make sure that it's uh, proportional. So the person living in a studio apartment who doesn't use that much electricity saves, um, you know, they save, uh, might save a smaller amount than the person in a much larger home or who uses more electricity, but it, it all evens out so that it's tailored to your own personal electricity usage and electricity bills. So we say it's like buying a $100 gift card for $90. And the point being you save each and every month as a part of community solar. And joining the program is also very easy. You would just go to sustainablewestchester.org slash solar, click the blue sign up button, select which project, uh, which community solar farm in Con Ed territory you'd like to sign up for. Um, I highly encourage anyone to go for the Marinol uh, community solar farm. And then you follow the steps along the way. Um, that would include having your Con Ed bill and billing details handy so that um, when you're signing up, you do put in your billing details so that eventually when your community solar farm is giving you solar credits, you're billed by your solar farm using the billing details you put in when you signed up. Then you type your name to eSign and you're done. And you could reach out to me at communitysolar at sustainablewestchester.org or call uh, this number with any questions. Um, and I, I'm not sure how much time we have left, but I do quickly want to talk about grid rewards as well. So the grid rewards program is another program that's free to sign up for. Um, and it's sort of a no brainer as well. Um, community solar is a wonderful program that supports solar development and provides savings to every single person and household that enrolls. And then grid efficiency is the next step. So we can build all of the solar and all the renewable energy generators we like, but if we're just constantly using more and more and more electricity, um, you know, we, we won't be able to really solve our collective energy problem. So grid efficiency aims to make sure that we limit our electricity usage, and especially during times of peak electric use when everyone in the community is using electricity and a lot of it. So it creates a positive environmental impact. Um, it lowers the carbon footprint of the community. Um, and then the grid wards program itself 
uh, allows you to sign up for an app on your phone and you will get notifications during those times when everyone is using a lot of electricity all at once. And it'll say, hey, can you turn off your or lower your electricity usage? And if you successfully do that by turning down your thermostat or, you know, not using your dishwasher or an electric oven, then you'll earn cash back for doing that. And um, so part of the reason why it's important to do this, not only is, is the cash back savings great for anyone that's part of the grid rewards program, um, grid efficiency is important because it leads to these spikes in electricity usage, which I mentioned just a minute ago. But if you see these red um, red boxes here, those are only a few hours out of the summer. And probably, I think these are times when it hit 95 degrees and we were all using our air conditioners and at home with the TV on or and the air conditioner and maybe cooking dinner and all the lights were on and maybe we were using our computers too. Um, whenever all of us are using all of that electricity at once, it's, uh, it really strains the electric grid. And when the electric grid reaches uh, its sort of limit, we have to turn, our Con Ed has to turn on these dirty peaker plants to make up for that electricity usage so that we don't all of a sudden try and turn on the next light and nothing happens. So these peaker plants um, only come into effect for these several hours out of the year. And they are extremely expensive. They cost four and a half billion dollars to operate every year in just New York State. So it's, it really is a huge financial issue. Um, but also they're heavily polluting. Um, and they're typically in areas that are in lower income communities. So the more we reduce our reliance on these dirty peaker plants, the better for a whole host of reasons. And that is where grid efficiency and grid rewards comes into play. So grid rewards, like I said, is an app that you download on your phone. You would go to sustainablewestchester.org slash grid rewards, and then it would give you the option to download the app on through Google Play if you have an Android phone or the App Store if you have an iPhone. And for anyone who's interested in signing up right now and, and checking out the app, you can scan that QR code with your camera on your phone and then click the link that appears to download the app. Um, and then it's the one important thing is that you will have to have your Con Ed online account ready when you're signing up for Grid Rewards. So you would download the app, open up the app, and then connect to your Con Ed account to the application itself within your phone. Most people have no trouble doing it, but every once in a while it can be a little finicky. And for that, we have um, a dedicated uh, support line through our partner, Logical Buildings, who help, helped us build this program. And once you're signed up for the app, you would get a couple of notifications throughout the summer during those times when the grid is extremely strained and it is those times of peak electricity use. And it'll give you tips on how to reduce your electricity for those periods of time. And depending on how much you lower your electricity use, you'll get um, a cashback award from Con Ed at the end of the year, or at the end of the summer. So again, it's a free program to join. It's sort of a fun game. We've had colleagues uh, who earn a couple hundred dollars back at the end of the season. And it's, um, it's kind of fun. It, it's fun, it saves money. It teaches you about your electricity usage and um, lowers our reliance on peaker plants. And with that, I'm going to end on grid rewards and pass it along to Lauren Broyce, who's our director of the Energy Smart Homes program. And Lauren, let me know if you'd like me to keep driving. Uh, I'll, I'll share my screen this way. I'll click through the okay. slides. Who, okay. who wants to hear the presentation where it's like, next, 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 right? So uh, let me do that. Hi, everyone. It's nice to see you. Hope you're having a lovely evening. Claire, thanks for covering the Sustainable Westchester intro. So we're going to quickly talk about energy smart homes. And before I do that, I just 
want to mention, just as a quick reminder, Austining is participating in the Clean Energy Communities Challenge. So the more people that sign up to participate in community solar and grid rewards and energy smart homes, the more money we can help to earn both the town and the village of Austining and Briarcliff too. So if you have friends that you think community solar or grid rewards would be a good fit for, not only sign up yourself, but help us sign up our friends and neighbors too. So a little bit about energy smart homes. If you are um, looking for ways to reduce your carbon footprint, but also looking for ways to save energy in your home, reduce wintertime drafts, perhaps make it more comfortable in the summer, you can take a look at having a home energy assessment. And we are here to help um, customers and homeowners figure out the right way that might be the best pathway for them. So maybe you want to learn more about home energy efficiency and insulation. Perhaps your house could benefit from an air source heat pump, or maybe you're thinking about looking at a geothermal or ground source heat pump. So we have a list of recommended contractors that can provide all these different technologies. We offer homeowner assistance and also assistance figuring out what are the financing options. So feel free to contact us. We would be happy to help. And these are the four technologies that we're really promoting. So I'm just going to move through the slides very quickly and give a shout out for some of the highlights about each of these technologies. And we'll do that. This is a slide of our partner contractors. So in Austin Town and Village together and Briarcliff as well. We have selected a list of six partner contractors. These contractors were interviewed and vetted by our local volunteer committee that's working on energy smart homes and um, they are all here to help do home energy assessments and site visits. All the contractors on this page will do an assessment for free. Besides one, Healthy Home is charging for their assessment, but all the others offer a free assessment. So home energy efficiency. So if you have really high cooling bills in the summer or really high heating bills in the wintertime, your house may benefit from things like air sealing and insulation. And now is a, a good time to think about your home's building envelope because there are some good rebates from Con Edison and also NYSERDA. There's rebates from Con Ed for the average income earner between $500 and $4,000 on common measures like insulation, air sealing, and windows. And for people that are um, falling lower on the average income scale, they can tap into even more rebates and incentives. So if you are a homeowner that receives enhanced star property tax exemption, or if any of these income limitations on the screen sound like the situation in your house, you can get a discount of 50% of the cost of the project. So that's a, a pretty significant rebate up to $5,000 back. And a next program called Empower is helping to serve people in homes and apartments, so owners and renters. This is for people that are below 60% of the area median income, and they can get up to $10,000 worth of free home energy upgrade work and an additional benefit is a free heat pump. So if you know someone that is receiving food stamps or is on a fixed income like Social Security, they could be a good match for the Empower program and we would be happy to help them apply and work through the different steps. Um, now just a couple brief words about the different types of heat pumps. So the idea that we're talking about here is electrifying everything. So just as Claire was talking about the importance of moving away from fossil fuels, this is a great way to do this as well. So instead of thinking about replacing your, your um, oil powered furnace or gas powered burner, you can think about moving to a heat pump. And heat pumps are electric powered equipment. And if you are using an ESCO or perhaps you have Westchester Power helping to supply green renewable energy to your home, and then you're heating and cooling with this electric appliance that's much more efficient, you are actually 100% fossil fuel free in your heating and cooling, which is pretty cool. So air source heat pumps have applications for people that have no ducts in their home and maybe would consider a ductless mini split. 
or there's applications for a whole home air source heat pump. And there certainly is a cost to moving to these technologies, just like there would be a cost to upgrading any heating and cooling system. But the good thing here is there's a lot of rebates on the market right now. So for a typical home in Con Ed territory, someone can get between $10,000 and $14,000 in rebates. And um, there's some additional incentives as well from um, New York State tax incentives. So ground source heat pumps, the biggest difference here is you would be drilling in the yard and this is a good match for someone that has existing duct work in their house or would consider installing the ducts. So again, it's a much more efficient way to heat and cool the home. And there's even more rebates and incentives for ground source heat pumps. There is a 26% federal tax credit right now that really can significantly lower the cost of this project. Enough so that if you're thinking of putting in central air to your home, you should take it down the geothermal route. It's actually more affordable to install geothermal system than it would be to install your typical type of central air system these days. And finally, a heat pump hot water heater is just a, a lovely way to heat water. It's the most efficient way. There's a $1,000 rebate on that from Con Ed right now. And certainly is something that people are replacing more frequently in their home. So you might have this on your list of things to do. Hey, we need a new hot water heater. Well, you want to think about perhaps doing a heat pump hot water heater. And I know we kind of ran through things pretty quickly. So if you're feeling like you want to review this again, on Thursday, Earth Day, whoop, whoop, we're having a lunch and learn from 12 o'clock to 12.45. And you'll be seeing me and Claire there again, talking about these different programs. And um, excitingly, on May 12th, we're going to have our first event in all Spanish. That's going to be 7.30 to 8.30. And on May 20th, we'll be hosting our virtual house tour. So some people in the neighborhood that have done this work in their home are gonna be inviting us into their homes virtually and showing off their equipment and telling us how happy they are in their homes. So um, these are just a little flyer for Thursday. You can even scan this little thing that's on the screen right now if you wanted to RSVP. And I think that covers it. So thanks everyone for joining tonight. or sustainablewestchester.org slash webinar. I think I saw that flash by. Yes, right? that's right. I, that's it, yep. Awesome. Fantastic. That is an awful lot of information about how we can really reduce our carbon footprint in ways that Sustainable Westchester is trying to make easier and easier so that you just sort of plug in and go. Um, there's a lot of information to download. I've heard a lot of these presentations before. Um, many of you have not. So I'm just going to open it up to the town board to see if you have any questions or anything that you think maybe needs a little bit of a clarification for the public. Um, otherwise, I'll open it up to the public. So open for the town board first for questions, comments, discussion. And is that um, not? Well, here you go. I'm just super excited that we have all these wonderful programs going on um, that benefit our community and our environment at the same time. And I know Green Austining, Susie Ross, and Sustainable Westchester um, have been partnering with Dana and the rest of the board. Um, and it's been great. So thank you for all the work that you all do. Thanks for that. And it's true, we've had lots of support and also uh, a lot of support from, um, we've had um, both Victoria and Karina in my office have been extremely helpful in, in, continue, in getting these programs off the ground in Austin and continuing them and helping share information out with our public. So thank you for my awesome staff. Um, okay, so hearing no other, yay. So hearing uh, no other questions, Susie, did you want to make any comments about any of the presentations before we turn it over to you? Because otherwise, I'll just open it up to the attendees to, if anybody has any particular questions. Um, I'll reserve mine. I'll just wait till I, I'm on. Fantastic. Okay. So with that, I'm going to open it up to the public. If anybody from the public has any questions or comments or anything else you'd like to add, We'll just look for your little hands to be raised, the virtual hands. And seeing none. Okay, 
Thank you for participating in that. And now thank you for to Lauren and Claire and Sustainable Westchester for all the good work you do for our, our um, Westchester communities and really helping to push the uh, CLCPA, which now I can't remember what it all stands for, but I'm sure Susie will remind us in a few minutes, um, and really making sure that we do our part here in our local communities in our county to um, start affecting change um, and affecting our own individual carbon footprints. So with that, um, I'm also thinking that we're extremely lucky to have Susie Ross here with us tonight, the creative mastermind behind 2021 Earth Week. I've been telling this story a lot. Um, Susie was at the farmer's market <laughs> this weekend, and I saw her and she's like, oh my God, it's so great to see you here. But I, you know, I feel like I've just seen you, but I haven't seen you. And I really did not know what she was talking about. She's like, you know, I haven't seen you for nine months. I'm like I see you every week. What are you talking about? But I really hadn't seen her in person for nine months. I just like, it really does feel like it. I had no idea. I literally didn't know what she was talking about. So anyway, um, we're so excited that you um, have really dreamed up an incredible um, in-person and also virtual Earth Week for our community to celebrate. You also chair Austin 100. I'm, I'm hoping you're going to talk a little bit about that tonight, which is helping us learn about how we can take responsibility at the individual level for our own carbon footprint as it contributes to the overall community footprint. We're so grateful to Green Austin for putting together an incredible state of events for this entire week. And Susie, you're here to show everyone how to plan out the rest of Earth Week uh, by participating in educational programs as well as ones that make you feel good and make our earth cleaner and that you can learn about this week and then take on into your everyday life for the future. So with that, I turn it over to you, Susie Ross. Um, thanks, Dana. Um, and thank you, uh, council members. Um, it's, it's a great pleasure always to come and talk to you about the things that we're working on. And I am always grateful for the support that you've given to Green Austin. And I do want to talk about Sustainable Westchester very quickly because I want everybody to realize how very fortunate we are to have um, them as a partner in, in a lot of things that we're doing. Um, not every county has that expertise and that assistance. Um, so Claire, thank you. Lauren has been a partner uh, for, this is the third program that we have worked on. Um, we started with uh, the Solarize program. Actually, we started with the, the program that Lauren uh, kind of worked on and launched, um, which was really the energy um, efficiency program. Energize. It's Energize Austining. Uh, then we moved to Solarize Austining. And now we're working on this program and Lauren has been a great partner, but she's also been an asset to both the town and the village on another level. And that is getting us all these extra credit points for our climate smart communities. Um, her expertise has really helped. And um, again, there are a lot of things that we could not do as a community if it wasn't for the expertise of Sustainable Westchester. So um, I can't really say enough. I know I can and I probably should because we want to end tonight at some point, but I really could go on and on. I also want you to know that um, there's probably, I think, we, I think uh, Lauren's uh, numbers today were about 10 community members per municipality are needed so that we can, for Climate Smart Communities, get $5,000. Um, I, in the conversation that while Lauren was presenting, I didn't mean to be rude, but I just downloaded, you can't really see it, <laughs> I just did grid rewards, so I'm one person. Um, and if I can do anything tonight, I am going to put a big ask out there. There is something that everyone can do tonight on any of those programs that were just mentioned. Grid rewards is, is a no-brainer for everyone. That is, you are getting paid back by Con Ed to, to basically use less energy. We can all afford to do that five times a year. Community solar renters, this is your thing. You don't have to pay for all the overhead that crazy people like I have had to spend the expense in doing. It's there for you. And Liz Feldman just did it for with Mary Null. So you and get condo, and condo owners too if your condo has isn't looking yeah solar. we have and, yes. and homeowners anyway right and yeah, yeah of course and homeowners as well so and those homeowners. two things are no brainers for anyone who has not yet invested in in solar on their roof um and so i'm going to 
ask everybody on this board to do that this evening. It takes 10 minutes or less. Uh, grid rewards, 10 minutes. That's how long it took me. Did you yeah, the re did the you reason I did it was because I have beautiful trees and I just could never get myself to get rid of the trees to yeah. use for solar. I know mm -hmm. a lot of people in our community feel that way. They would love to be a part of the solar project, but they just really love their trees or there's just too many to, they have no sense. So yeah. I'm hoping that we can get the word out that, you know, even those with trees can take right. part in this. Yeah, and it, and whether it's, you know, saving money or looking really to reduce your carbon emissions, it's a win-win. Um, we do have a deadline on grid reward. I want to remind everybody it's April 30th, so we don't have a lot of time. And whether it's, in, I'm, I'm making you feel bad about it and I'm guilting you, great, do it. Um, it's important for our community. And I'm not just talking about the $5,000. We have to find ways to individually reduce our carbon emissions. And these are very turnkey, easy ways brought to us by our great partners at uh, Sustainable Westchester. So I'm here to talk to you about Earth Day though. So um, I am not gonna, I don't have a lot of show and tell. I'm gonna bring you over to the website in a moment. I want to just start with, um, we felt that, um, you know, last year we missed out on our opportunity to gather at the river like we always do. And um, it's always a, a kind of feeling that, you know, the spring is, is out and, and it was quite sad to not actually have the event after planning so much. Um, and so we didn't want to miss out this year. So basically um, the Green Austining team sent a note out to those who had, those vendors who had signed up in 2018. And we asked if anybody was interested in doing anything special for Earth Day. And we kind of, you know, gave them some ideas of things that could be done. And we expected we would have um, 30 different opportunities, events, things of, of that nature. Um, I am literally loading things up every day. We've had, we have over 100 different events, activities, offers um, from community members and from different sources. There's probably 50 different people who have come up with ideas. Some of them are multiple um, on multiple evenings. Some of them are on multiple days. There are offers such as IFCA that is, you know, go in and, and you know, mention green austening and, and there's something special there for you. So a lot of fun things. Um, the Austin Public Library, I mean, there's there are um, online experiences, there are in-person small experiences, Fable is doing something special. I really thought that I'd be able to drive everybody to the website and not have to talk about these things every day. But I think everyone is starting to get a little maxed out with, with the, like Dana thought that she saw me and she didn't. We all are starting to lose our sense of reality. So these tactile things are, are very inviting. Um, the OBCC, they're doing, you know, open houses. I mean, we have, there are opportunities for people to get out and do, th do things. Um, Clearwater is joining us tomorrow to do seining. I mean, there's so, so whether you want, and we also have somebody who's teaching people backyard compost. So if you're not bringing your stuff to our food waste at the farmer's market or Cedar Lane, which is open and free to everyone, another way to reduce your carbon footprint. Um, learn about backyard composting tomorrow. Actually, no, it's on Earth Day. So um, there's a, a bunch of other things that are happening. There's cooking classes and learning how to eat healthier. There are discussion panels. Climate uh, Citizens Climate Lobby is holding one with um, Sing Sing Kill and Good Choice Kitchen because of their bus sustainable business practices. Um, there are uh, some really clever things, a story walk in Wishney Park that's sponsored by the Public Library. So please get to my calendar, which I'm going to show you in a moment. Um, Karina, are you there? Yes, you are. Thank you for being one of the brainstorming people about figuring out how to get these events onto the Green Austin calendar. Um, and I, by the way, I'm not doing this alone, although it's feeling like I am right now. Um, but uh, a couple of things that are upcoming. Um, the community-wide uh, tag sale is coming up. We did not think we would be able to have it, but people are doing it. I think this is the most uh, participation we'll ha we've had so far. Uh, the deadline is uh, this coming weekend on the 24th. We have 30 homes across Briarcliff and Austin that are participating at, as of now. I expect that we'll have more. Um, a shout out to everybody who participated in the largest community-wide cleanup 
this past weekend, um, there were 125 plus volunteers. Um, Riverkeeper Sweep is also on the same day as the community-wide sale. That is another great opportunity for people to get out and participate in the cleanup of one of our most essential natural resources, which is our river and tributaries. And Westchester pollinators, I don't want to forget about talking about them. Westchester pollinators launched, launched probably about a year or two ago. Um, and we finally have a voice with somebody in our community that's willing to kind of lead this, uh, Margaret Phelan, who I know, I think she works uh, with the Jug Tavern, um, but she is going to be at the Austin Farmers Market this Saturday. And what we'll hope to do is start to map pollinator pathways throughout the community. So that's an exciting thing that's happening. Um, we are always at the farmer's market every Saturday, thanks to the partnership uh, with the town and the work that Victoria did with the grant writing, they had all these things going with T-Town. So many great people working on so many things in this community. I am not doing this alone. I just happen to be the person talking about it, um, but it's amazing. And um, let me bring you very quickly, do I get to share my screen? Yeah, okay. All right, I'm assuming you can see my screen. Yep, okay. So you're gonna to go to the Green Austining website. Looks like this, www.greenaustining.org. That's it, hit the Earth Day Festival. It will bring you to this page right here. And if you scroll down, there are a couple of I'm going to just change it. This is where you can click on here. It'll bring you right to the very same place. So it's just easy enough to, to just go down to the calendar. When I have you guys, I have to move you off of my screen here. There we go. All right, so you go down, you can actually just type in what you're looking for. Um, if you wanted to see, by the way, this coming weekend on Saturday, if it's 60 degrees or higher, we might see yoga in the park. Uh, so that, that's gonna be a nice event if we can do that. Um, so that's there, but don't have to do it that way. We can just search by events in chronological order and you can see what's going on. And I am, I'm going to ask for an upgrade on um, getting my website to work faster, but starting tomorrow, Starting tomorrow, there are a few events that will pop up and you can look at this any way you want. I'm just going to scroll down. But as you can see, you can just run through this or put a date in or click on something that you know is happening, but you can't kind of remember the name of it. Uh, once you get in there, let me give a quick shout out to the emerging environmental leaders that Kemi Poe started with at the Roosevelt School. They're doing some cool stuff but you basically click on and the information is there about where to go. If it's an online event, that information will also be within, um, within the event itself. Um, if it's at a location, there'll be a map there and all the information is within it. It's a pretty simple um, map. It's a pretty simple event calendar to use. Um, I just want to say, I don't think it's Roosevelt. I think Washington School, is that what you mean? Washington School, yes, sorry. I'm thinking Roosevelt Square, but it's the Washington School. Thank you for that. Um, so, uh, so much going on. Um, I, I feel like there was a couple of other shout outs I wanted to give, um, but just again, a lot of community members, I don't know if anyone's ever had the opportunity to see Max's Arcade and Max, Max is a, a student in the Austin School District that has been putting together for comes uh, with recycled materials. He's doing these online now for everybody to kind of, all the kids to kind of learn how to do it. Um, again, that's in our calendar. Um, and just some really great things that are happening. So um, I don't think I'm forgetting anything. I'm happy to take questions, um, but I do want to make sure that every under, that everyone really does kind of realize that, that you know, we're doing this, we try to integrate the fun and all that good stuff that, you know, that we can get the kids involved and get them into, but, you know, it's kind of up to us when it comes to the carbon emissions part and the Energy Smart Program, the uh, Community Solar, um, the Grid Rewards, these are big things. Our largest carbon emissions comes from our transportation choices and comes from our home energy and as adults. I also want to give one quick out to the Austining 100 carbon tracker, which will help everybody kind of understand what their individual footprint is. 
We are happy to walk anybody through that at any time. You could give us a shout out. We have open houses. We had one tonight um, and we need to see more people participating in these things because we don't have a lot of time yet to make um, our lives on this earth in a very comfortable way before it's irreversible. So it's serious, but we're trying to make it fun for Earth Day. So um, with that horrifying note, I will end unless people have questions. Thank you so much, Susie. And there really is so much going on and we're so appreciative to all of the volunteers with Green Austin and Austin 100 and uh, all of the other um, people who've stepped up uh, and participated in this week long, week -long event. Um, okay, so I'm going to just open it up again to the town board with any questions or comments. Well, I'm super impressed that we have over 100 events. I was telling News 12 about it on uh, Saturday when we were doing the uh, Stash of Trash. Um, I believe the Risco Music School is doing a Make Your Own Instrument with Recycled Materials event as well. Yeah, I mentioned that um, in the announcements. Okay. Well, my computer keeps shutting down, so I'm having a lovely time tonight. Anyway, um, Thanks, so Chris. anyway, just a big shout out and thank you to all of the people and all of the groups that are taking the time to show how important this is to our community and how much we really care. So that's all. Thank you. Anybody else from Town Board? Thanks for all that you're doing, Susie. Uh, I it's a, just a whirlwind of activity. Um, when uh, we got the email from you from IFCA, at IFCA um, asking, you know, if, do we have something creative we can do? We actually sat down and we started thinking about things and it, it made us think about things in a new way. So I, I know others were doing some cool and new things for this year for Earth Week. So thank you for that. We had to like think about it. And I think we're doing some cool stuff at mm -hmm. IFCA and obviously at other places. So thanks for making us think out of the box. Thank you. Certainly, you know, for IFCA residents to join some of these programs too, um, to help them save money on their Con Ed bills um, would, is also a great, a great thing, great rewards, all of those things for everybody at IFCA. Uh, okay, anybody else from town board? I would also like to add that, um, you know, this has been such a great success and so many programs are getting highlighted and rolled out that um, we may continue having extra events through the Earth Week um, in addition to our wonderful Earth Day Festival next year, please. Sure, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah, and there's lots going. of lessons we could learn during this pandemic about ways that we can enhance our uh, um, reach, yeah. people's our reach and, and uh, participation um, by utilizing some of these remote resources that we've learned all about this in this past year plus. So that's absolutely true. So uh, with that, I'm going to open it up to the public. Uh, is there anybody who wanted to comment or have any questions from, uh, from Susie's presentation? And seeing none. Thank you so much once again, uh, Susie. I really, really appreciate it. And we hope everybody does sign up to participate in events if you haven't already done so. Next up, we are very happy to report that after just about a year with a general pause on grant applications coming from the state, funding opportunities are coming up again. And I'm sure that that's also partially due to our federal government stepping in and helping to support our state. We have our town planner, Valerie Manastra, with us tonight from Nelson Pope Voorhees to talk and walk us through the highlights of some of the current grant opportunities available to us via the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, as well as the Westchester County Planning Department, which is actually a federal program that goes through the planning department. Then as a board, we'll discuss some potential projects for applications. Valerie, can you please start us off? Sure, thank you very much. Uh, so as uh, Dana mentioned, the state is starting to release some grants we haven't received information on the, you know, the yearly consolidated funding applications yet, but what has been released are some Hudson River Estuary grants, um, as well as, um, well, this is more on the federal level, the CDBG program. So one of the things I just wanted to highlight tonight with the Hudson River Estuary uh, program grants, I did send you a summary of the grants as well as the matches that are needed and the eligible, potentially eligible um, 
projects that could be submitted for. And there's three different types of grants right now under that program, a stewardship planning grant, which is really specifically focused on adaptation projects for climate change um, risks, specifically dealing with uh, sea level risks, uh, sea level rise risks. Um, at River Riverfront Education, which is dealing with uh, tidal waters of the Hudson River, and then river access. And this is really deals with access to sites for both boating, fishing, swimming, as well as wildlife recreation. So the primary purpose for the Hudson River Estuary Program grants is really focused on the Hudson River. So for the most part, I think the, you know, the town land mostly would be really focused on the Angle Waterfront Parks and potential park projects. These particular grants range somewhere between 10 to $50,000 and they do require a 15% match. In addition, CDBG um, is coming through its three-year cycle, and one of the parks, again, that falls within the overall low mod areas within the town village of Austin is the Angle Waterfront uh, Park as well. That the CDBG grant, as, as this board is familiar with, has a much larger uh, funding source and can actually take on larger projects more than the Hudson River Estuary Program grants. And so with that, we really wanted to focus or talk to the board about what are some projects that we might want to consider putting in for funding for both either the Hudson River Estuary Program Grant as well as CDBG Grant, really focusing on Angle Waterfront Park at this point. So thanks so much, uh, Valerie. And before I open it up for discussion, I think that we can all agree that these grant opportunities basically shout out for Lewis Angle Park. Uh, as it's located on the Hudson, it's in a low mod area, which basically are the parameters for these grant opportunities. However, I do want to point out that we've been hearing a lot recently through our comprehensive plan process, from our environmental advisory committee, through our rec advisory board, our town board, other stakeholders, and our own staff, that there are many, many projects in all of our parks that are needed to improve both the active and passive recreation and environmental stewardship that are just as important and necessary. Unfortunately, those projects are not necessarily eligible for the grant opportunities available right now, or they're not ready yet for those grants. Um, so either they're not shovel ready or they're not in a place yet where we can act upon them to apply for grants for those projects. Uh, but there may be opportunities in the future to seek funding, further volunteer efforts, or to draw on other partnerships to complete these projects. So I wanted to propose that we consider undertaking a parks prioritization plan to identify projects that need to be completed and potential funding sources or other means of implementing these projects. That would give us an opportunity to pull together the many suggestions that have come to us from various members of the public who have an interest in improving all parts of our parks and set us up for success for future opportunities as future opportunities become available. So Valerie has offered to help us with this prioritization plan and maybe Valerie, you could explain to the board a little bit about what you think that would look like. Right, so in our discussions with these particular grants, especially the Hudson River Estuary Program Grant, you know, it's, and I've had numerous meetings with the Environmental Advisory Committee and then of course the Comprehensive Plan Committee and we're getting public feedback from over the Comprehensive Plan as well as presentations that have appeared before you prior to from the Parks and Recreation Department as well as the Recreational Advisory Board. And so what is, what's clear is that there's a lot of projects, there's a lot of potential projects within your parks, but one of the things that we're finding is that every time a grant pops up, it's this little bit of a scramble of identifying what projects, where could we, you know, fit it in, do we even have cost estimates, do we have engineering studies, and what I thought would be helpful to the town is actually, you know, basically um, calling all this information together, right, and so identifying, for example, like Ryder Park. What are the um, you know capital improvements that have been identified for potential active recreation, you know passive recreation, you know your stewardship projects and programs, environmental restoration projects, you know also maintenance projects or engineering projects that are not necessarily associated with active or passive recreation, but could be like stormwater projects or park paving projects. And so I think you know you have between your staff and all the different um, committees and organizations throughout the town, there's a lot of ideas and a lot of concepts. And I thought it might be helpful to the town board is to start pulling these different projects together. And that's like the first step. And then the second step would be working with the town board to prioritize 
what projects we really want to seek funding for and which ones, you know, even this would also help you when you're dealing with your capital um, budgets every year, identifying which projects you want to move forward with in the various parks. So I just open it up to the board for comments on that. And also comments on um, any of the, you know, any of the discussion that we had about which, um, which projects that we want to prioritize for CDBG and for the Hudson River estuary grants. Um, I just had a quick question. How much are we using the um, presentation that we had from the Rec Advisory Board where Pat kind of, uh, I think, yeah, Pat presented it. And they had like a list of things. Are we using anything from there to prioritize or at least list the different projects? Well, I think that's exactly what we're talking about as being okay. one, of, one of the inputs for yes. this larger part yes. prioritization plan. Okay. I just want to make know sure that, that that's there and that we also had our own capital plan. Okay. You know, so the park, the, the REB had one idea. And then, you know, the, the capital projects, that was a second idea. And, right. you know, um, so again, you know, these different pieces come from different groups and um, the EAC, you know, they have ideas for, for trail, for a trail connectivity plan. We're hearing, you know, different um, things pop in the comprehensive plan inputs from, um, from our public um, through that process. So all of those, and there's a lot of great ideas. I mean, there's tons of great ideas. Um, you know, I, I recently met out at the park um, to look at the pond in the back of, back of Ryder, which has come up a number of times. And, you know, a lot of these projects are very expensive and, um, and everybody wants to do them all at once and get them done right away. And they're, they're expensive, they're time consuming. You know, if we use our own parks department resources, we can't do them all at once. So we need to, you know, come up with a, a long, short-term and a long-term plan and also look for these grant opportunities. I mean, one of the reasons we um, put together the Habitat Stewards program was because we had a lot of interest in some of the, you know, areas that don't usually get the type of attention that our, our fields and our play areas that maybe get more active use get. Um, and to be perfectly honest, that tends to be the area where our recreation advisory board focuses attention on those more active uses of the park. So the back areas of the park where people maybe walk the trails or walk their dogs or smell the flowers or just, you know, hang out, um, don't get the same attention and they need it and they deserve it. Um, but it's hard to get the attention when you need to use your resources differently and you don't have a huge department. So um, having being able to partner with volunteer groups or, you know, we have the New York, New Jersey trail conference. Um, David Margulies ha is now on our EAC and he's been involved with that and they cleared the Briarcliff Peekskill trailway. And he's very interested in trying to connect up some of our trails and the EAC has been talking about that for years. All of these things uh, obviously take resources and whether it's in the form of volunteers, it's in the form of, um, you know, just cash dollars or whatever, we're looking to maximize the amount of money that we can bring in from outside sources. So putting together a plan where we start saying, okay, well, we need to have an engineering report. We need to come up with costs for each of these projects, including our uh, recreation advisory board projects um, that are real dollars and then figuring out how we can best utilize some of the grant opportunities that are out there or the other volunteer resources. So yes, REB is going to be considered. That's a long answer. Yes, <laughs> I also think it's. I also think it's. It's. Um, I just wanted to point out that a lot of times you you throughout the year you might get smaller grants that kind of pop up or you know approach like Victoria's radar or my radar. And this would, if we have something that's again, if we have like a, a document where it houses all the major projects that are identified for the different parks, we can easily call through those and then identify, yeah, this would be a great, you know, project for that particular grant. Yeah, no, I think it's a great idea to have it all, you know, ready and in a whole organized, have a little waiting room, if you will, for projects for grant matches to come along. And prioritize, you know, there's so many things that we'd love to do. Um, as Dana said, getting the funding for them is a challenge. So, yeah, looking at having it all organized and laid out is a great idea. 
um, the riverfront, did you say one of them, which the three estuary grants were? They were for stewardship planning, um, river education, and then river access. Okay, so stewardship planning, would that be something we could get some of the invasive species out of our rocks and, and kind of re, re strengthen that? So the, the, with the stewardship planning specifically, they're really focusing on, I mean, we might be able to, and I'll have to take a look at it, because um, there is some plan for conservation of natural resources, but the thing is most of it is really supposed to be focused on sea level rise and climate change risks. However, um, what we might be able to do is under the riverfront access, we might even be able to identify, if, you know, I think the, there has been some concept of potentially looking to open up that beach again. And so maybe as part of that, we can also look at besides water quality, but also pull, you know, dealing with vegetation and uh, trying to deal with some of the invasives and actually make the environment a little bit more natural or native than what's existing there now as well. Okay, great. I know we've been working toward uh, getting that beach open for a while. Right, I, I think um, one of the steps is gonna take us to reach out to Gareth. I think he's been really uh, spearheading some of that information and then to try to pull that together and potentially identify that as a potential Hudson River Estuary grant program. And then of course, in terms of the invasives, we can also wrap that into if we move forward with the CDBG and upgrades to the water, excuse me, Angle Waterfront Park, then we can also incorporate that into the overall project as well. Um, yeah, there's, I mean, there's so many projects we could do to yes. <laughs> enhance the fishing, enhance, you know, right. fix up and the I, ramp, fix up this, you know. So I think that's all going to be part of our Angle Park, um, mm -hmm. the bigger, the bigger uh, ask for the CDBG grant. And we did also just um, put that in for a community uh, community projects grant also through um, Mondaire Jones's office. So I know that we're not gonna hear about those right away. We just found out that there's another line of funding. Um, we'd put that as well as the 133 bike lane connectivity project in, and that um, might also be eligible for transportation fun funding. So um, we quickly pulled together a transportation uh, grant application yesterday, which is the same project, just with a different line of funding in case we are able to get funding for one project under one and one project under another. Don't know if that could happen because they're gonna probably cherry pick, you know, however many they can give to each member, but um, we can certainly try and um, spread the wealth a little bit. So, you know, we're hopeful that we can get funding from through multiple sources and that's what we always are looking for. Um, so we are, you know, CDBG again, low mod income. Um, this is basically we have Angle Park and we have our senior program that are eligible for these types of grants. And um, we did actually get a number of um, grants for the senior program, the, a new minibus as well as, which is hopefully gonna be delivered in July, as well as um, upgrades to the kitchen, um, which we're still hoping to hear back from our architects soon about that so we can get those started. And then, um, you know, we had applied for Angle Park um, Master Park Plan uh, funding through through this program before. We think we know what we have to change to try to get that moving, and we would help have be able to uh, apply for help from the um, planning department at Westchester County to help with some of the landscape architecture um, elements. We also have more information now from the county. Beck Gareth Huffman has been working with us on to help us figure out what um, testing we have to do. We have a map of the, um, the outfall from the, um, the, the sewer treatment plan and we know that it's far enough away um, as well as being able to tap some of the river keeper um, and the Austin High School Environmental um, Club testing that's been going on over the years, all of those can help us uh, get the beach potentially open again. So we're not sure if it's gonna be this year or if we have to use all the testing from this year to get it open for, for next year, but we keep trying. And as soon as we can, we will work in that direction to try to get something um, 
at least get, you know, have, have ac accessibility enhanced at the very least and have information shared about what um, is allowable. And, you know, we don't really want to open the beach obviously without everything in place and we can't open it without Westchester County allowing us to. And that also requires that we have showers and things like that. So there's lots of pieces of the puzzle to put together as, as usual. Um, and we're continuing to work in that direction. And also the enhancements would include the fishing docks, which need upgrades as well as other things. So we wanna look at those all in context of um, climate change and sea level rise. Um, so hopefully we can, we can plan for the short and long-term simultaneously. So with the lower income focus with the CVG, with, with the grant, um, is it only directed to areas that are tend to have lower income or can you do it for projects that would enhance the lives of people with lower income? Right, so I can answer that. So it's, it's both. But the thing is, if you are supposed or specifically focusing on populations that have, or that you're gonna help with low mod, you really do have to tie it directly to that, um, like that population. So that's why a lot of times you have organizations who specifically, whose missions are to work with low mod income populations on, you know, those will, that's where you get that mission-based type of CDBG application. So if there's, if you have a particular project in mind, we can take a look to see if that would directly tie back to a particular low mod population. And then at which point we would be able to potentially seek funding for that. Also, you have to actually prove, you yes. know, there's a lot of hoops to jump through to prove that you can't just sort of like say, right. oh, this is going to appeal to, or, um, you know, like even camp is kind of iffy, like, so you can't, you know, we've tried to think about if we could try to use that for some of our other parks. And I think that it's just not enough of a percentage of the time. Um, so there's, again, there's like a lot of hoops. I don't know, Victoria, if you want to try and chime yeah. in at all. That's okay. I haven't. Yeah. You often also have to collect like tax returns from people to document that you really are serving that particular population. It is, like Valerie said, um, primarily for organizations who usually have a lot of that information already documented and maintained um, in case of uh, it was ever audited. So when you're focusing on an area, it's a little easier to say, okay, the geographic location is clearly in this census tract that is um, low to moderate income population um, than, than everything else, unfortunately. Okay. Thank you. So is everybody sort of in agreement that we we're gonna focus on for right now, Angle Park for these upcoming grants and then we'll work on a bigger um, master grant park prioritization plan so that we can be ready for some of these other um, grants that are gonna come down the pike, hopefully not to just distant future. Yeah, I, I agree. Jump. Yep. I, I think that's a good idea. Okay, great. Fantastic. So thank you everybody so much. Uh, our next step is going to be to work with Valerie on a plan to complete these upcoming grant applications, kick off our park prioritization plan, and the CDBG program requires that we hold a public hearing in order for the public to be heard on our next round of applications. So we'll have a resolution on next week to hold that public hearing at our first legislative session in May. Um, I'm now going to open it up to the public. If you have any comments or questions um, or any of our panelists who are still on with us and thank you guys for, for holding out. Um, if anybody has any questions, comments about this or anything whatsoever, um, this is a town hall meeting. So feel free to um, comment on anything whatsoever. Now's your chance. If you wanna raise your virtual hands or your real hands or your Zoom real hands. Susie, <laughs> feel free. And I'm looking and seeing no hands. Guys, your, your virtual hands are tired. Oh, there are, there's some questions in the Q&A that I'm just seeing. Oh, thank you for some comments from Gabby Hamilton. She thinks that it sounds like a great program, which I don't know what that was. And she's looking forward to the programs. And I think that was, uh, since you just made that comment, I think that that's in relation to um, some of the 
um, upcoming work that we're going to be putting together for our parks and the great program that you were commenting on was probably all of the Earth Day festivities. So thank you for those comments. And the answer to my question is, was that true? Yes, it was. So <laughs> thanks, Gabby. Um, anybody else have any other questions or comments? And or wanting to raise their hand and just say something great? Okay, and I am going to say that is no, but I want to thank everybody uh, for your participation this evening. We're so excited to be wishing everybody a happy Earth Day, happy Earth Week. We hope that everybody's going to step up and sign up for Grid Rewards, Community Solar, um, learn more about Energy Smart Homes, and all of the other great programs. And um, I, I know I'm going to try again for yoga this Saturday with Alicia at the waterfront. It's part of our Mind, Body, Spirit Offsing program as well. Um, and uh, we've been doing a tremendous amount of work to try to step up to help our environment and do what we can here at the local level in the town. And we just hope that you will also at home participate in all of these efforts. With that, can I have a motion to adjourn to executive session for advice of counsel, contracts, collective bargaining, and personnel? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thanks again for joining us. Check out the great activities planned for Earth Week on the Green Austin calendar and join us next week for our town board legislative session on Tuesday, April 27th at 7.30 p.m. via Zoom. Have a great night, everybody. Oh, wait, hold on one second. There's one last Q&A. Oh, that was for, from Gabby. Thank you and have a great night. Thanks to you too. Have a great night, everybody.